Good morning, Christ United Methodist Church. Welcome to worship. Welcome to another Sunday when we get the privilege of spending time in God's presence, no matter where we are, if we're in the sanctuary, we're at home, we're on the road. Just take a deep breath and remember you're loved. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, you surround us every moment of life with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. May we find the energy we need in these moments to sing praise to your name, to lift you up, to glorify you. Thank you for coming into our lives. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for sending Christ to die for our sins. And thank you, Lord, that these moments of worship can be rejuvenating, can be healing. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Welcome. Welcome, Sam. Good morning, everybody. Special uh, thanks to Lois for filling in for Kim on the piano and for Jenny for sharing your ministry on the organ. It's good to be here today. Let us begin by doing what the song invites us to do, and that's come, Christians join to sing. Let us stand and let us worship and lift up the name of Jesus, our guide and our friend. Come, Christians join to sing. be seated. Come on, children, down and gather around the front with Pastor Darrell. Those at home, gather around the TV. <laughs> He's going to visit on the way up. Hi, Bobby. How you doing, Bobby? I like your dinosaur. Awfully cool. He's been ready. Well, today we're talking more about friends. And last week we talked about how God calls us friends. And today we're going to talk about how we might be friends with God. Now, my guess is the three of you have friends. You have friends, right? Oh, okay, good. So if your friend is really excited about something, we tend to get excited with them, don't we? We tend to get excited about the things they get excited about. And when they're sad, we're sad with them. And so today we're going to talk about how to focus on what makes God pleased and do those things and be stressed about what stresses God out, which is people that don't know him. So this morning I want you guys to, if you're going to stay in the sanctuary, you will, little ones will probably get to go play. 
maybe I should go to the toddler room and just hand my sermon notes to Pastor Sam. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? You don't think so? Uh, you could do it. No, okay. Well, I want you guys to think about how to be friends with others And what does that look like when we're friends with God? How do we be concerned about what God's concerned about? The first thing is we got to know what God's concerned about, and we would find that information in the newspaper? No, where? The Bible. That would help us to know what God's concerned about. Sunday school, vacation Bible school, all that stuff teaches us what God's concerned about, so we know that. Let's pray, and then I think I have some lollipops here. Thank you, Lord, that you give us friends in our lives to walk through life with us. And thank you that you are our best friend. Help us, Lord, to learn as we grow up what you're concerned about, what breaks your heart, what brings you joy. And may those things be a part of who we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you like a lollipop? I bet Bobby wants one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dude, there you go. You need one of those. You're welcome. A couple of prayer concerns before we sing a song and spend some time in prayer. Um, Matt Crop is the son of Vicki Engel. Um, he spent a couple days in the hospital with blood clots in both lungs. We need to be praying for Matt. Some of you are aware through Facebook that our friend Pastor David Jans was in the hospital this week. He went in last Sunday after worship, unable to walk. He had an MS flare. It appears he has developed a new lesion. And um, after some IV steroids, he was able to come home Tuesday night. He um, took it pretty easy this week, but he is doing much, much better. So continue to lift Pastor David up. Sharon and I's two, uh, I'd love to say little ones, because that's the way I remember them, but now the lo- youngest one is three inches taller than me, so when did that happen? Noah and Toby both had wisdom teeth out this week. Noah had two out on Monday. Toby had four out. They're back to a regular diet, and um, still a little discomfort, but doing well. Krista Caddy um, passed away this week after short illness. Some of you know Krista. Uh, be holding that family up in prayer. And also Hannah Lewis, uh, a young girl, 21 years old, leaves a little daughter, passed away this week. Be praying for Hannah's family as well. And we got word on Friday that Bill Henshaw from our congregation passed away on Thursday. Um, so his viewing is tomorrow at Garden Airs from 10 to 12, if that's something you want to avail yourself to. Let's keep Kim in prayer as she continues to struggle with her back. Um, There's a bunch of folks from the congregation on vacation. You know my rule. I only pray for you if you're going to Florida, if you take clergy support with you. 32 years, I've never had to pray for anybody going to Florida. Worked out really well. No, we're praying for folks as they're uh, spending some downtime, praying that it is renewing and invigorating that they can come back and re-engage. So we're going to sing a song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and then we'll spend some time in prayer, okay? Just remain seated and allow these words to prepare our hearts and uh, our spirits for a time of prayer. Let us sing. What a friend. Peace we often forfeit. 
before we pray, I just need to tell you, you know, some of those, a song like that, old time song, we sometimes say, ah, I'm not really into that one. One time I um, was singing Amazing Grace of all places in a classroom at school and thought, I hate this. And we sing it all the time. And then I heard it for the first time. And the song completely changed for me. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. I don't know about you, but I'm the kind of person that sometimes will carry a burden way longer than I need to before I take it to God in prayer. It doesn't always change the circumstances, but it changes the burden. Amen? Let's hold up these individuals and so many more to God. Let's pray. Father God, you are so much more ready to listen than we are ever to pray. So many times, Father, we hold on to things so much longer than we should. Instead of coming to you and seeking your help, seeking your wisdom, seeking your strength and your peace to deal with our crisis. Father, we've mentioned only a few of the concerns that are resident in our congregation today. There are so very many more needs. Father, I pray that you would inspire us in these moments to lay our burdens at the foot of your altar and to trust you. Here are the things that burden our heart right now, Father, and the joys that bring us peace. Thank you, Father, for all those faces that have just flashed through our mind. Faces of folks that are struggling, faces of folks that are doing well that we are thankful for, faces of folks who have encouraged us, faces of folks that journey with us and make life more tolerable. But thank you especially for your face, for the one who loved us supremely and demonstrated his love by sacrificing for us. Thank you that you made a way that the Holy Spirit can now journey with us every moment. Thank you, Lord, for the the peace that that brings, the strength, the calm, even in the midst of tragedy and crisis. Lord, walk with those who are grieving today. Surround them, guide them, comfort them. Walk with those who are facing surgery. Give them peace and remind them that you hold them in the palm of your hand. Journey with those, Father, who are recovering. Although progress may be slow, Father, remind them that it is still progress and that you are still holding them. And walk with us, Father, as we strive to know you better, to draw near to you, that we may sense your presence daily. Remind us, Father, that you're not trying to steal our fun, but you're trying to give us abundant life. May we open our hearts and allow you complete access. Now, Father, open your word to us that we may see it again for the first time. And it may transform us. We ask all of these things, Father, in your Son's name, and we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Some of you know from time to time I like to write music, I like to write songs, and they usually are for a specific uh, purpose. Um, but I'm thinking back now to om- around 50 years ago, I wrote my first song. And um, I remember the title of that song was, He Cares, He Cares. As a young boy in the midst of, some of my own confusion and uh, worries, I was uh, inspired by 1 Peter 5, 7 that says, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. So I wrote those words, uh, are you weak and loaded with burdens? Are you searching for something that's not there? Are you losing out of that hope of heaven? Would you like to meet Jesus? He'll show you that he cares. Friends, there's no other friend like Jesus. Let us stand and let us celebrate the one who wants to be our friend and cares for us. Let us stand. Lois was worried. She thought I'd change the song and she was going to have to start playing He Cares, right? I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus Since I found in Him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how He changed my life completely He did something that no other friend could do No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. All my life was full of sin. When Jesus found me, all my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me, and he led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand but he'll never know just why he came to save me till someday I see his blessed face above no one ever cared for me like Jesus there's no other friend so kind as he no one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. You may be seated. Thank you, Sam. Good morning again, church. If you open your Bibles to the book of James, and look at that, the slide matches. I don't have the wrong book of the Bible on there. Last week, I don't know what I was thinking, but it just wasn't lining up. James, the fourth chapter, starting in verse 4, says this. 
you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Here ends the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. James makes it clear that, that when we choose to be a friend of the world's, we're choosing to be an enemy of the fathers. Now, I know the slide says Vegas, and some of you have been to Vegas, and you say, what's wrong with Vegas? Nothing's wrong with Vegas. I, I had a, a couple in one congregation I served it every year would take a vacation to Vegas. I never quite got that. I've never been to Vegas, so maybe I'm missing out on something. But for me, it's what it symbolizes, especially in the... Uh, in the adage, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You know, when we, when we decide that we are going to f- allow culture, allow the world to set our priorities and agenda, that is, is, is what James is speaking about. When he calls us an adulterous generation, what he's referring to is the whole Old Testament um, notion of of the adulterous Israelites, those who, who stepped out, if you will, on their marriage covenant with God and were willing to follow false gods. And God calls them adulterers repeatedly in the Old Testament. And that's what James is referring to. He's saying, when, when we claim to be followers of Christ and yet live at the calling of culture, we're committing adultery on the one we claim to follow. We're stepping out on our relationship with the one we claim to follow. He says, when we, when we allow the world, the culture, to be our driving force, then he's saying, listen, your walk with God is going to suffer. Instead, as we've been talking about last week and this week and for the next couple of weeks, we want to talk about what it looks like when we engage in this friendship with God. He calls us friend. That seems odd to some of us. We've never really thought of ourselves as friend of God. We've still got that thing in our mindset where God is the resident cop who's waiting to bust us and give us a ticket. Or the judge who's eager to find us guilty and punish us. Or Santa Claus, who we can ask anything of and he will just do it. All of those are inaccurate views of God because they do not take in the entire understanding of who God is. When we say God is friend, we are closer to the heart of the Father. He desires, He created us to walk with Him every day. So, what is it when we're God's friend? God's called us to be friends, and if we desire this relationship with God, our lives ought to reflect that. Television is always trying to redefine things. The other day we were watching a show, Sharon and I, and and it showed this young girl who was developing a friendship with a girl in town. But that friend was constantly putting her in compromising positions. And I said, that's not really a friend. When we become friends with God, he will never do that. But dare I say that there have been many times that we have done that to God. We claim the name of Christ. We let people know we go to church and that we're Christians. And then they look at our lives and they say, really? Or as Mr. Goldinger said to me in class one day, oh, you're a Christian? I couldn't tell. That's not good. 
People ought to know that we're Christians and they ought to be able to tell that we're friends with God. So James give us, gives us three things we can do if we're going to be God's friend. The first one is, he says, submit to God. Submission is all about authority. Who's in charge? Who's calling the shots in our lives? Uh, the world, culture, self, which is what the world says, isn't it? Whatever feels good. Whatever you want. Whatever makes your heart sing. However you want to define yourself, that's fine. That's what culture says. God says um, there is truth, and it's not found in culture. Culture changes constantly. Most of us have lived long enough to watch that happen, huh? We're watching the fashions of the 60s come back, and most of us are cringing. We didn't like them the first time they were here. We definitely don't like them when they're coming back. Submitting to God is about deciding that the one who is going to have authority in my life is the author of truth. Submitting to God means deciding that God really does have a plan that's better than the one I can come up with on my own. I don't know about you, but there have been some things that have happened in my life that I never saw coming. Has that happened to you? Folks that have died that I, I never thought I'd have to live without. Relationships that ended that I didn't expect. Tragedies that have happened. A pandemic. I, I didn't see that stuff. Did you? Did you know all that stuff before it happened? You do get that none of that surprised God. God has never been surprised by a tragedy, by a world event, by anything. When we submit to God, we're saying, God, we are trusting you that you know what's coming next and you know what's best for me. And he is always, always ready to lead us. So who has authority in your life? To whose drum are you marching? Who's driving your bus? Who's in charge? Are you allowing the latest fad to be what drives you? Or have you decided that there is an authority that has stood the test of time? Written by the one who created you and all that is around you who's never been surprised. Submitting is about following God because we know we can trust him. And we know he has our best in mind. The second thing James says to do is to resist the devil. Resisting the devil is, yes, it's about dealing with temptation. You remember Jesus being tempted in the desert and, and every time the enemy threw something at him, he had a godly comeback. He knew scripture well enough to know exactly what scripture said. Boy, you know, had Eve understood God better, she'd have known that when the devil said, ah, oh, that's not really what God said, and that's not really what's going to happen, and, and maybe God doesn't have your best in mind. Had she known God better, she'd have known he was lying. But let's not be too hard on Adam and Eve. Let's remember that you and I do that every day. Every day. Every day God says, if you will avoid this, life will go better. And we go, no, you know what, God, I'm really okay with that. And we step into sin and allow temptation to take over. I know you don't have that conversation in your head, but that's in essence what you're doing. It's as though every day the enemy offers us poison to drink, and every day we say, oh, please, can I have some of that? And then we're stunned that we're sick. Really? Really? Resisting the devil that he will flee is about reminding the enemy of the truth. He is not about truth. He's never told you truth even once. He's only twisting truth. 
So it's, it's striving to deal with the sin issues in our lives. And let me be quite honest with you and quite practical. Sometimes that requires somebody else to be helping you journey through life and helping you to figure out why you're believing the lie instead of seizing hold of the truth. I had a conversation this week with an individual that said, I I had a good therapy session. They said, "Um, my counselor and I were talking and I, I realized why I do some of what I do. I realized that for as far back as I can remember, I just thought that I was completely screwed up. And I wasn't worth anything more. And I'm starting to realize that's not true. Does that sound like a dialogue has gone on in your head? That somehow God loves the rest of the world, and the rest of the world has got to figure it out, but you alone are a mess. You alone are unworthy. You alone, God has question about. Not true. The enemy is going to try to convince you of that, and he's going to use all your past experience to remind you how messed up you are. So sometimes it's resisting sin, and sometimes it's resisting the lie that the devil has been selling you for sometimes decades. And saying, you know what? Scripture says that I'm loved by God and that he finds me valuable. So you telling me I'm junk must be a lie. And resisting the devil is saying I'm no longer going to believe that lie. I'm going to believe truth. If you want some truth to help um, reframe your life, crack open to the book of Ephesians and read the first two chapters of the book of Ephesians. You will find there 50-some references to how important you are to God. You. Not your neighbor. Not the pastor. Not a missionary. You. Follower of Christ. Allow those references to sink into your soul. And remind you of the truth that God thinks you are amazing. Does he love what you do? Not all the time. But he thinks you're amazing. And he so desperately wants to engage with you. Which is where the author of the book of James ends. The last thing he encourages us to do is to come near to God. He says, if you will come near to God, God will come near to you. You don't have to come to church to feel near to God, but let me tell you, there's something special about this space, isn't there? I, I walk into this space on Sunday morning, and I just, I start to get excited. Because I know that in this space, there has been worship to the one true God for so very long. And God has made himself known so many times. Can he do that at your house? Yep. He can. But sometimes we're so distracted at home. It's the same thing I say to soon to be newlywed couples. I always ask couples the same question Are you going away on a honeymoon? And what I sometimes hear from couples, especially if they've been living together, is, Well, we're going to do that later. And I say to them, Whatever you do, you have to go away for at least one night. And they say, Why? I say, Because if you go home, it'll feel like the same old thing. And I want you to start this marriage feeling completely different. If you go home, you'll throw a load of laundry and you'll remember something needs picked up. You'll do some dishes. That's not what you need to be doing on your wedding night. So go someplace different. That's what coming to church is all about. It's it's getting out of the usual and drawing near to God. to Have a different experience. Can you sing what a friend we have in Jesus at at your house? Absolutely. Let me ask a question. Those of you who tuned in during the pandemic, was singing in church better than singing at home? Oh, it was. My wife thinks so too. Because singing here, she can't hear me. Singing at home, she doesn't have a choice. Plus, 
when we were at home watching, especially Christmas Eve, I about drove her nuts because the older boys were there and we started bantering back and forth because I was uncomfortable seeing myself on TV and she said it was one of the worst worship experiences she's ever had. You see, there's something about finding a space where you can draw near to God. Maybe you have a little place set up in your home where where you've got a devotional and you've got your Bible and you have a routine there. Some of you need that. And and, and you're very faithful to that. Every, Every morning you're found there or every evening or every day at three, that's where you are, drawing near to God. For some of you, Drawing near to God is done much better away from home, in the church, out in nature where you can just be still. Wherever that is, find that space. Pray over that space. Push out everything that would distract you and get close to God. There are a variety of spiritual practices that you can use to help you go to a deeper level with God. There's Lectio Divina, reading scripture in a a threefold way and listening for a word from God. There's meditation. There's safe place prayer that Sharon teaches even to children that, that give us an opportunity to close our eyes and visualize a safe space and invite Jesus into that space and just spend time with him there. What a healing experience that can be. There are so many ways that we can connect with God. God doesn't say, well, you have to stand on one foot, juggle three eggs, and talk to me in Hebrew, otherwise I'm not going to come near to you. In which case... I'd be lost. I can't juggle at all. And when I stand on one foot, I often fall over. The Hebrew thing, that's a whole nother story. God says, whatever works for you. And take your eyes off of somebody else. What works for Pastor Sam, what works for Pastor Daryl may not work for you. What works for you may not work for us. I led a retreat one time on getting close to God and using your personality. And it was revolutionary to me as I began preparing that retreat because I realized that I didn't have to come near to God the way my friends did. I've been told for a long time that solitude and silence was a great way to get near to God. Okay, look at me. Me. Solitude. Silence. Seriously? Not happening. Felt guilty about it for decades. Lord, what's wrong with me that I can't do this? And then an author said, look, you've got to find a way to get close to God that matches your personality. My wife can do silence and solitude like you can't believe. Why? She's an introvert. She loves solitude and silence. Me, I'm a strong extrovert. I hate solitude and silence. That's like putting me in jail. What is it that's unique about you? And God knows those unique qualities, and he is ready to connect with you in that unique way. For some people, they have found that they love to crochet or to sew, and they make prayer shawls. And what they do is every time they put a stitch in, it's it's an expression of love and of prayer as they spend time with God as as they either knit or sew these prayer shawls, And then they give them to people. What a neat gift. Maybe that's how you need to connect with God. Maybe you're an athlete at heart. And you love to run. Or you love to walk. Or you love to bicycle. Or you love to paddle. Maybe every crank of the pedals. Every stroke of the paddle. Every movement of your leg is a prayer to God. Then do that. And use that unique way to connect with God to draw near to him. Maybe you're a baker. And you can crank out cookies by the dozen. And every time you form a cookie, it's an expression of prayer to God. It's an opportunity to draw near. You hear what I'm saying? 
We're not all the same. We're not all going to find the same way to draw near to God, but he is so eager to come near to us that whatever works for you, he's right there. He's not off in a distance saying, well, when you figure out how to get over here, I'll be there. He's just waiting for you to be still long enough in your heart. Maybe your body's frenetic at that moment, but your heart is finally still. And he's rushing in to embrace you, to connect with you, to talk to you, to to commune with you. To pour into you exactly what you need. Come near to him. He's eager to come near to you. Friday was covenant group day. Our friend Dave didn't make it. We didn't think he would with having just been in the hospital. But the other four of us couldn't wait to get together. We were eager to see one another, and it was hard to part company even after three and a half hours. Is that how you approach time with God? Oh, I can't wait. Time's coming when I can spend time with God. When I get to draw a little nearer. Man, I can't wait. I wonder what he's got for me today. I wonder how he's going to speak to me. I wonder what he's going to reveal to me. He's never going to reveal shame. That's the enemy. He's never going to reveal condemnation. He may reveal conviction. He may reveal a place that you need to get right with him. But it's going to be done in such a loving manner that you're going to be okay with it. It's the enemy that's saying to you, you're a mess. That's not God. Tell the enemy to do what? Leave. Resist the devil and he will flee. God calls us friend. But so many times we find ourselves keeping this friend at a distance. And then we wonder why we don't recognize him when he speaks. The more we draw near to him, the more familiar we become with his voice. When I hear one of my four covenant group brothers on the phone, I don't ever have to say, who is this? Do I? I know immediately who it is, even without caller ID. Wouldn't it be nice if we got to the place in our journey where we could recognize God's voice, whether it showed up in the beauty of creation or in the face of a child or wherever it was. John Eldridge talks in his book, Fathered by God, about how God is the lover of a man's soul. For most men, that's a little uncomfortable because we still think of God as male and that kind of messes with our brain. I get that. But he gives an example. He says, God has placed in John, or or placed for John, these, these little reminders that he loves him. He said, it seems odd, he says, but it's it's anything in the shape of a heart. And he said, You would not believe what I have come across. I'll be fishing a stream in Colorado and looked on and there's a heart-shaped rock at my feet and I'm like, thank you, Lord. It's a reminder that he loves me. So I read this in the book and I wondered what God might be using to remind me that he loves me. Some of you have heard me say that I have this affinity for a four-legged creature that's a bit timid and has a white tail. In fact, it annoys the heck out of my wife because we'll be driving down the road, she'll be talking to me, we'll be deep in conversation, in the middle of a sentence that she's saying, I'll say, deer! She's like, I'm talking to you, I know, but there was a deer over there. She says, you see them all the time. I know, but they're cool. On the bike ride out of D.C., Nathan and I Saw a deer every morning. Sometimes fawns, 
sometimes just a couple of dough, occasionally a buck in velvet. And every time I saw one, my heart smiled because I knew God was reminding me that he loved me. The other day, I'm driving down the road with Toby and his friend in the back seat. It was that Friday night that we had the horrible rain, and the rain had just stopped, and we're on some backcountry roads trying to weave from Polk to Centerville. There's nothing between Polk and Centerville, by the way. Nothing. But there are a lot of deer. And at one point, we pass this field, and all I can see out of the corner of my eye is about 15 brown specks in that field. And without even taking my eyes off the road, I said, look at that herd of deer. And Toby looks over, he goes, how do you do that? I said, it's years of practice. And I didn't even bother telling him the story that that's God's thing between he and I. Thursday, I was coming back from visiting a pastor that I'm mentoring and saw three deer. I count them. I know that's weird, but I count them. And again, I just smiled and said, thank you, Lord. Come near to God. He is so eager to show you his love. And he is so faithful to walk with you. How do we develop this friendship with God? We draw near to him and invite him to talk to us. Uh, A word of warning, he will. And he'll make himself abundantly clear. And you will never be the same. Let's pray. Father, you have called us friend. And we're still trying to get our head around that. But Father, we want to move in your direction. And I pray, Father, that your presence would be so obvious, that your voice would be so clear that no one would be able to miss it. Lord, give us discernment to know when the voice that we're hearing is the enemy. Give us wisdom. Give us patience. Give us space to come near to you that we may hear your voice and yours alone. Thank you for your word. Thank you for worship. Thank you for friends that help us to hear you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Daryl. Sorry, though, our next hymn has strong overtones of solitude in it. (laughs) But the real point of what we're going to sing is that we have a God that no matter where we are and what uh, environment we're in, he wants to walk with us. He wants to talk to us. He wants us to hear him call us his own, and he wants us to call him our own. So let us stand and let us sing and just um, if we could uh, see the slide with the phone number on it here, I want to remind people watching and those here, if you need to learn more about coming near to God, call the church number 432-3019 and hit prompt three, okay? I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and He walks with me talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none of
seated. Well, let's um, be ever so mindful and thankful that God wants to be our friend, and he is there for us. Our offering time is a time when we give our thanks to him. The ushers will wait upon us, and we will give our gifts to him from gracious hearts because he has been so gracious to us. Let us pray and offer our thanks. Oh God, thank you for walking with us, for talking with us, for calling our name before we even called yours. Lord, we give these gifts now as an act of worship. Lord, I ask your blessing upon everybody who has been so so generous and those that are here those that watch us online lord thank you for each and every one bless their families bless their homes bless them as individuals and lord now receive our gifts they come from our hearts in the name of jesus we pray amen Let us stand and let us offer our praise to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. As we come to our closing moments, let me share with you a couple of um, announcements that you need to be aware of. 
This Tuesday is staff planning retreat, so if you call, you're going to get the answering machine, and uh, we will be off-site for most of the day planning and praying, so uh, be aware of that, and there is no Bible study this Tuesday. The 11th of August is the next drive through dinner, and um, they are always in need of hope, or in need of help. Yeah, we're in need of hope, too. So for something you can do to help out, um, they got the main cooks they need, but there's also other things to do, just let Ann know. Uh, We're currently accepting scholarship applications for the Continuing Education Awards. Um, There are applications located on on the welcome desk, and you can also get those from Amy if you have college students in your sphere of influence. All right. Um, We have a family looking for some child care in their home. Um, if that's something that you're interested in doing, talk to Amy at, uh, Amy at the office, and she will connect you with that family. Let me make you aware, there's a, um, we are working on a promo piece that's going to come out next week in the bulletin, but I want to jump it because we've only got a month. This year, the annual conference to raise money and awareness of camperships, instead of doing a five-day bike-a-thon or doing five one-day run-walk bike-a-thons, And they want to do them across the annual conference where there are bike trails. Hmm. That means Franklin. So September 4th, the Saturday before Labor Day, we're going to do a walk, run, even paddle, bike-a-thon here in Franklin. We're going to start here at the church with a light breakfast. Head out. There will be courses um, open for you to explore. And uh, we'll provide snacks and, um, and some refreshment on the rides if you need them, um, and it's all to raise money for camperships to help send kids to church camp. So we'll get this piece out next week uh, so that you'll know how to register and things like that, but if you have opportunity, uh, mark it on your calendar now so that Saturday morning the 4th, it starts at 9 a.m., you'll be done before noon unless you decide to do the 30-mile ride with Bill and I and you get lost in the tunnel, then you'll get back about 6, you know. Nah, we'll we'll get you back in decent time. Um, So, mark that on your calendar. We've received a bunch of thank you notes from folks, um, from uh, people who are just pleased with with all that the congregation has done for them, from Karen Bingman and Bob Snyder, but also from the VBS group. So, some people have asked, okay, so what was the breakdown on these boxes of cereal? We talked about 268 boxes of cereal. The congregation provided 159, and the kids collected 209. You weren't even close. Sorry. You weren't even close. But boy, community services was blessed. And in exchange, or in turn, the people of this community were blessed by your donations of cereal. So thank you very much. Hey, we're going to sing one more song, and we'll get out of here. Thank you. Let us stand. Let's go out with this message in our minds and in our hearts. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Remember in sorrow. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul.
go in peace and may the peace of Christ go with you. Amen.